Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, December 20th, 2023. Mike Benz returns to our uh, program today. Yeah, we got a lot of very pos positive and favorable feedback uh, on you, Mike, the last time you were on. And we were talking about the government interfering with the freedom of speech. And Mike is going to discuss some absolutely incredible efforts by the government, particularly, particularly the CIA, to interfere with the freedom of speech. Mike, it's a pleasure. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Judge. Excited to continue our chat. Oh, thank you. So uh, be, before we get into uh, the CIA and music festivals, just address for me this general question. How dangerous is the CIA to personal liberty? They're tremendously dangerous. And, you know, it's, it's helpful to think of the CIA as being part of this diplomacy, defense, intelligence apparatus. You know, a lot of times you can sort of think of many of the operations of the Department of Defense and the Department of State as being inextricably woven with the Central Intelligence Agency because it sort of acts as the cloak and dagger arm of those two uh, pillars of our defense and diplomacy subject. So it's really one conjoined apparatus. And, you know, the CIA is very unique because it has a license to lie. It was created under the 1947 National Security Act specifically to do the sort of dark arts cloak and dagger stuff that the State Department wanted to do, but couldn't get busted doing. And so they wanted this plausibly deniable agency to, to do the dirty work that would be an international fiasco if the government got caught doing. Is it as bad as the old KGB? In many ways, uh, you know, it, it's hard to use a word like worse there, given, you know, some of the history of the Soviet Union. But the, the technological prowess that's available today to the Central Intelligence Agency and the the hubris, I think, that set in after the Cold War was won uh, makes it un unquestionably at least a, a, a rival in terms of the, the tier rankings of malevolent forces in intelligence history. Does the CIA or do agents, employees, officers, analysts, I know there are different levels uh, of CIA workers, do they acknowledge, at least internally and within the walls of their headquarters at Langley, that they kill people? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the CIA is, is formally in charge of our drone program. This this happened during the global war on terror, the when there was the apportioning of of you know, military capacities between the DOD and the CIA and the drone program was effectively handed over to the Central Intelligence Agency. That's remote control assassination with the bad history of targeting weddings and other uh, other type of events that cause international scandal. But, you know, e even more perhaps insidious than outright killings and even assassinations. Assassinations were sort of banned after the church committee hearings in the 1970s after the CIA killed Lumumba and killed Allende and killed a bunch of world leaders and got got busted doing it essentially. Then they said, okay, all right, we're not going to assassinate world leaders again, but we're sort of going to kill everyone around them or uh, or leaders of insurgency groups. But even more pernicious, perhaps than than the than the outright killing is is the authorization for for quote organized political warfare. You know, right when the CIA was born in 1947, in, in 1948, George Kennan who's one of the godfathers of the CIA, penned this memo called the Inauguration of Organized Political Warfare, where he basically said, listen, we, we just rigged 12 days ago, this is in 1948, right before this memo was penned, so 12 days ago, we just rigged this election in Italy. We worked with Sicilian mobsters. We worked with, uh, we worked with members of the church. We, we worked with this whole underground that was persecuted by Mussolini, who we had these partnerships with in order to establish a beachhead in Italy during World War II. We worked with them to rig the 1948 Italian election because if the communist won in that case, then there might never be an election again in Italy. So we had to rig this one, but it turned out really well. So we're just going to keep doing it in Greece and then in France and Australia. I mean, they, this became a blueprint. And now we're sort of living in the shadow of total unchecked power uh, for going on 80 years now. Uh, for whom does the CIA work? Is it the president of the United States? Is it the Secretary of State? Is it the Secretary of Defense? Or are they yeah. are they rogues? Are they totally on their own? Well, technically, they operate, you know, they're, they're part of the executive branch under the president, but they're really the underside of the State Department. 
you know, the, the State Department and the CIA have been kissing cousins, so to speak, since the day the CIA was created. You, you had Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles re, uh, serving as uh, the CIA chief and the Secretary of State, essentially brothers running both of those. That continues to this day under the Trump administration. You may recall Mike Pompeo was the director of the CIA, and then his next job was the was the Secretary of State. What you essentially have are are kind of two towers of our global empire management, one being overt diplomacy, the State Department, the other being covert diplomacy or covert action, that being the Central Intelligence Agency. And both of those overt and covert sides of our diplomacy have to be synchronized in order to have a cohesive plan of action in a country or region whose right. elections we want to yeah, yeah. So our, our um, uh, former CIA agents and officers who, who come on this show have uh, almost uniformly bemoaned the fact that Bill Burns, the current director of the CIA, is a member of the president's cabinet. Is, is there some some uh, substance there or is it just symbolic? I'm not sure about that. You know, Bill Burns has, you know, he came directly from the Carnegie Endowment. You know, he's, he was, for seven years, he was the head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is, is, a, is a seven decade history of serving as a CIA conduit. He was obviously a major State Department official before that. I, I, it's it's hard for me to, to penetrate the, you know, the cabinet role versus versus a not in terms of its, its significance, but certainly um, one of the big, knocks that the foreign policy establishment had against Trump was was that he, he, he through his lack of promotion of the democracy promotion programs and these sort of State Department dirty tricks programs, uh, they wanted a more fully imbued CIA and State Department dirty tricks capacity like what had existed uh, for many decades prior to that. Trump was obviously the first president in something like 40 years not to declare a new war. He also put the kibosh on a number of initiatives ranging from Syria to uh, to Afghanistan uh, to, to operations in Ukraine. So so the elevation of, of the role of the Central Intelligence Agency under, under Biden uh, would be no surprise to me. Um, one of the things that you have brought to our uh, attention uh, when uh, we communicated earlier this week was the role of the CIA in art and music festivals. Now, when I first heard this, I smiled and I said, look, Mike's a smart guy, but this is really off the wall. Can this actually be happening? So give us a little bit of background on what the CIA does with art and music festivals. And are we talking about art and music festivals in the U.S. or outside the U.S.? Because you and, I have both, you and I have both read the CIA charter and a pretty clearly prohibits them from doing anything in the U.S., even though we know they do. So give us right. give us a big picture, and then we'll run some clips from these music festivals. Sure. And a quick note on that. The church committee hearings in 1975 and 1976 had their basis in part on the fact that the CIA had actually gone against that charter with things like Operation Chaos and their infiltration of left-wing student groups who were anti-Vietnam War they were essentially paying left-wing student publications on college campuses in order to sway hearts and minds uh, against the sort of far left, which at the time was was anti-war. But and when they got caught doing that, that of course led to these sort of left-wing oriented church committee hearings to to say never again will you will you break this charter. But returning right. to, to arts and to, to arts and music. What we had uh, in 1948 with the UN Declaration on Human Rights was this idea that you could no longer conquer territory by force. It's no longer accepted by international law that you could just roll into a country with tanks. You had to have some sort of de a democratic predicate. The hearts and minds had to sort of ratify the support for the governance structure in a particular uh, country. And, and the, the modality of taking over a country effectively in order to exploit its resources, you know, ex extract its, its gas or its minerals, uh, in order to have it serve as a as a basically 
proxy state for our military bases. You had to have the hearts and minds of the citizenry at least ratify that, that government in support of, of U.S. policy. And so everything shifted to organized political warfare, again, returning to that George Kennan concept from 1948, when, the year that the U.N. Declaration on Human Rights is ratified. And so very quickly out the gate during the Eisenhower administration, there became this, this idea that organized political warfare means everything is essentially an instrument of statecraft. And very quickly, arts and music became co-opted. In 1952, for example, the, uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was, was constructed by the Central Intelligence Agency to serve as a cutout for dominating arts and culture at a time when the U.S. had not yet established hegemony in that, in that respect. Uh, there were many uh, Russian composers like, uh, like Shostakovich uh, who were sort of said to be best in class in things like classical music. And so the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was set up and funded by the CIA, flew the, the Boston Symphony Orchestra over to, uh, to Paris for concerts in 1952. And then they set up strings of con concerts in Rome in 1954, all throughout the 1950s and, and 60s, actually all through the 70s as well, culminating in not just concerts in, in France and in Italy, but also these large outdoor music concerts in West Germany and in Berlin in 1976 in, uh, to, to gin up uh, protest sentiment in order to tear down the wall and reunify Germany uh, as part of the Euro-Atlantic axis. Now, this goes all the way back even, even before the Congress for Cultural Freedom. In, in the 1940s, the State Department began working with jazz musicians. It was called jazz diplomacy at the time. And mm -hmm. this was a way of trying to get African nations who were newly sovereign after World War II to not see America as being this sort of, you know, white ethno state to not see to sort of tamp down on accusations of colonialism and racism and they recruited assets like louis armstrong and many other uh, jazz musicians who are household names this is all well documented it's on the state department's website actually uh, but music as an instrument for, uh, of statecraft has existed essentially since the moment world war ii ended you can make an argument it was rolled up in the office of war information during world war ii itself but it extends to this day uh, just Two months ago, Tony Blinken announced a brand new music diplomacy initiative at the State Department for the State Department to work worldwide with musicians in order to uh, stymie authoritarianism. This is not a charity mission. In fact, just just two years ago, this, this, let me let me just uh, stop you. This this is news and didn't seem that you're breaking now. Didn't seem to appear anywhere. What what is Tony Blinken doing, and what does he hope to achieve with this? Tony Blinken being the Secretary of State, right? So this is a brand new music diplomacy initiative. It, it broke about two two months ago. I covered it quite extensively, but you know, I, don't, I think the news media did not quite pick up on on the significance of this. Uh, you know, unless you enjoy reading state.gov, um, you know, tell alls, you, you don't really get into the, the minutiae, I think, for a lot of folks on, on how these operations work. But a, a great example of it was just two years ago when there was the revolution in Cuba organized by the San Isidro movement, an arts collective in Cuba, a rap group in Cuba that was funded and incubated by the National Endowment for Democracy, who is perhaps to this day uh, the, the world's most premier CIA cutout, even the Washington Post in the 1990s acknowledged that the National Endowment for Democracy serves as a CIA cutout. Its founder says that we do overtly okay, with the CIA. Okay, let me, let, me, let me just stop you for a minute. So CIA gets tax dollars and gives them to a Cuban rock group through, so it funnels it through the National Endowment for Humanities or the National Endowment for Democracy, whatever they want to call their uh, front group. What is the That's CIA it. trying to accomplish by putting American laundered tax dollars into the pockets of Cuban rap musicians. So the way we, there's two ways to topple a foreign government. The old style way was you bribe, you know, you, you get a, a certain quorum of the military establishment to, de, to defect. And so you essentially have a military coup. But the other way that was developed primarily uh, early after World War II is this technique called a, you know, a color revolution, which is a people powered revolution where you primarily rely on street muscle from young people and from student groups and then you have trade union labor uh, laborers, you have people from all across the society sort of do a collective walkout. That way the state can't marshal instruments 
of it, of uh, institutions within its own country in order to enforce the law. And then if they crack down on these protests, they're subject to enormous international sanctions and essentially lose their sovereign wealth funds held in the Federal Reserve or held in the U.S. dollar. And so you have this technique of getting the young people, the youth and students to take to the streets in, in protest to shut down government buildings, to shut down the infrastructure and to destabilize the country from the inside until the president is ran out of power, as what was done to Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014. And so this relies, you need to get hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. That's that's the end goal. That's what the end stage of any color revolution okay, looks and, like. And, and to do music, that, music is very powerful to that extent. It, so just one one it. quick thing here on the Cuban group. They they created this anthem called Patria in Evita, which was basically like blood and soil which is this, this sort of nationalist anthem against the communist government there. And that, was, that, that song became the rallying cry for the concerts. To this day, my, I was just at Miami Art Week. They had exhibits on, on this song and its role in the protest movement. The CIA did the same thing with creating a song called Winds of Change by the Scorpions in the 1970s in an effort to try to galvanize German youths to reject uh, the, the East, uh, East Germany uh, Soviet government. So this idea of having a theme song, of having culturally uh, significant and popular figures that that essentially create the kind of soundtrack of a protest and cuts across all the differences of the different groups. So it doesn't really, they don't really care if, if whether one of the factions is pro-abortion or anti-abortion or pro-capitalist or pro or pro-socialist. If they're all listening to the same music, they're all reviewing the same cultural figures, they all have a reason to be at the same party together. They all have a reason to take to the streets together. Got it. Got it. All right. Now this music CIA where it appears where it appears as though you're at an art festival. Before we run this, give us the background. What are you doing there? What is it? What are you narrating? And then we'll play the clip. Sure. So this is Miami Art Week that I was at. This is the largest arts festival in Miami. Miami is the gateway to Latin America and the Caribbean, the largest CIA station house in the entire country for the entirety of the Cold War was called JM Wave. It was the CIA station house in Miami. And so this is it's sort of a, a culturally significant event in Miami with thousands of, of artists, both visual art and musical art. And so I like to do these sort of walk and talks wherever I go to sort of explain some of the intelligence or national security ties to a region. So I thought this was sort of a fun opportunity to explain that in Miami. Okay, uh, Sonia, music CIA. So it automatically creates this cultural cleavage point to draw people towards a Euro-Atlantic axis. If they're listening to Taylor Swift or if they're listening to Moby, they're not listening to Russian music. They're not listening to Chinese music they're not listening to Cuban music, although the CIA has made inroads to try to co-op Cuban rap music uh, quite profusely through the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, incubating uh, Cuban art collectives. So when you have these big art festivals, they're a prime opportunity to draw people into a cultural affinity that can then be mobilized later in time. These people are much more likely to attend mass protests uh, and in large events to take to the streets when they're already used to going to large concerts and things together, especially in places that are more culturally repressed where you don't tend to have these more often. No, I can't I can't resist asking you about Taylor Swift because as we speak, she is the hottest phenomenon in the country, maybe uh, in the world. Does the CIA have any role in her success? Well, I don't have any direct evidence of the CIA's role, but there is a very curious oddity that came to light just months ago, which is that Taylor Swift's entire discography, the rights to it, were all purchased by the Carlyle Group in tandem with, with a George Soros investment fund. So the Carlyle Group, if you're not familiar, is is sort of the private equity arm of the of the Iraq war. Uh, the, the Carlisle group Frank is essentially- Carlucci, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole, you know, Bush, uh, you know, Rumsfeld, uh, Cheney a axis was, was all aligned on the Carlisle uh, group's board. Uh, they were essentially, the, you know, the private equity grifters par excellence of the military industrial complex you know, from, from the 90s to the present day. Now, they they personally purchased Taylor Swift's uh, discography. She had to re-record tracks recently 
in order to have new rights to her own music. Now, she's currently in the middle of something called the Eras Tour. I think they just extended it, which is the, the largest tour, essentially, in, I think, in, in world history for a single touring artist. I think it was something like 300 cities, some crazy amount. Now, Taylor, what the heck is the Carlisle Group doing involved in the affairs of Taylor Swift? You know, just on my timeline on X just earlier today, I put uh, a, a tell-all by Miles Copeland the third, who's the, the son of a, a major CIA figure who himself uh, talked about a phone call that he got from Donald Rumsfeld during the Iraq war. You know, Copeland was the manager for Sting and the police, one of the, one of the sort of the, the, the male Taylor Swift of the 1990s, if you let will. Me, let me stop you and we will play what you posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, which is Miles Copeland talking about receiving a phone call from... Donald Rumsfeld. Sonia? So I get a call from Donald Rumsfeld. My secretary comes up to me and says, Miles, it's Donald Rumsfeld on the phone. I go, yeah, 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 sure. You know, so I pick up the phone, you know, thinking this is a joke. And it's uh, the deputy secretary of defense, Tori Clark. And she says, uh, we hear that you know about our music and we think there might be a way to win hearts and minds in the Middle East. And would you help us come up with some programs that uh, we might do and put forward that helps us, you know, make the Rockies not hate us, you know. Well, I said, well, sure, you know, I'm a loyal American, I'm happy to help. The plan is to find 12 girls who will be the basis of a, of a show featuring uh, Arab dance and Arab music. What becomes of this? Well, what you have is the military acquiring modalities of culture. Now, this is, we're seeing, we saw this in music and in arts throughout the entirety of the Cold War. You see it apparently in, in escalating fashion today. There's many other examples of this, but, you know, my focus is censorship of the internet and the military's move into acquisition over, over media is perhaps the most, you know, saturating of all of those. When, when the hybrid warfare doctrine was declared by the DOD, after the Crimea counter coup in 2014, they essentially said, you know what? Civilian run media isn't working out for us. We need the military to have, you know, these disinformation structures, these censorship structures to stop, uh, to stop people from running their own media scene. And, you know, this, this is obviously, as we're discussing now, a, a, the, the reason they may have confidence in doing that is they did that so elegantly in music and in arts and so many other modalities, it's only natural to sort of uh, make that a fait accompli in, in, uh, in taking over social media. Mike Ben, it's always a pleasure, man. You, you, you come up with uh, intriguing observations and studies of government excess. The last time uh, you talked about the, the government using a carrot and a stick uh, to influence social media. Now you're telling us that Taylor Swift might be on the payroll of the CIA through a very circuitous route. Wow. Keep it up, my friend, and uh, we hope you come back again the next time you have another one of these exposures for us. Thank you, Judge. Have a great day. Oh, of course. Uh, all the best. Um, Judge Napolitano, for judging freedom, just bear with me, and I will remind you who we have on uh, tomorrow. I should have had this uh, for you uh, uh, at the ready. Ah. Tony Schaefer at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning Eastern. Professor John Mearsheimer at 9 o'clock Thursday morning Eastern. Scott Horton at 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, Eastern. And Friday, usually, usual with a bang. Gary Barnett, one of the most insightful analysts of government that I know at 1 o'clock Colonel Larry Wilkerson at two, our CIA roundtable at three, Scott Ritter at four, Ask the Judge at five, and then the break for Christmas. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.